I can tell you, Tim, that while Shaq was talking, a few of the things that former President Trump said is that we're meaning the United States, we're a developing nation too. Look at Detroit, look at our cities. He called out Barack Hussein Obama and said China thinks we're stupid. Just yesterday, at one point, Trump told people to vote on January 5th. Fact check, that's not election day. What do you see happening here? Uh, yeah, well, and then there was the North Korea style statement there. As a former flack, I just like re listening to that statement from Stephen Chung and the Trump campaign, like as if like he is a Kim Jong un style dictator who has to be the smartest person in history is a little alarming as well. Um, look, I, I mean, Donald Trump, this is, this is the thing about Donald Trump is that in this campaign, they decided, the team decided that they're just going to let the public see unadulterated Donald Trump, I, I, you know, and uh, and that worked for them in the Republican primary because Republican primary voters like unadulterated Donald Trump. And the reality is the real Donald Trump does not have any of the views of like mainstream conservatives from a bygone era. If you let him be Trump, he's not going to talk about tax cuts and regulation cuts and strong defense. Like that's not him. He's going to do racist dog whistle, racist air horn, really type comments about things that are wrong with the inner city. He's going to talk about mass deportations. He's going to talk about 1000 percent tariffs. He's going to talk about having, sending the military after the enemy within. So like that is Donald Trump. And it's the Harris campaign's job, and you saw they started to do that last night, to make sure that the voters know that when they go to the polls. And I suspect that's why she's doing Brett Baer as well tomorrow over on Fox, because she wants the small percentage of Fox voters that are still in that old school style Republicanism to recognize what they're voting for if they're voting for Trump. It's this unhinged uh, material that you just read. Uh, Zerlina, I, I want to play part of what one person who was at, and obviously a Trump supporter, said who was at that event last night. We talked to a bunch of them, but I think that this is indicative of how a lot of folks who were there last night felt. Here it is. I felt like I was sitting in a, in a room with him, just him. I could have I could have been here another hour, another two hours. Uh, it, was just, it was just great spending time with uh, the president. I did expect him to take more questions. I thought he would talk longer. However, I still will vote for him. He, I think he's a very good candidate. And I, um, the concert was great. <laughs> So clearly, Zerlina, this isn't the kind of thing that discourages somebody who goes to a Trump rally. But do you think that either individually or cumulatively any of this matters to undecided voters? I don't know how many undecided voters there are out there. I think there are people who don't want to admit that they're going to vote for Donald Trump. Maybe they're afraid of some of the judgment that comes along with that decision. But I do think that it's clear as day to me that the people that are at the Trump rallies, the people that continue to support Donald Trump, are not doing that because of specific policies, because he's not talking about policies. That rally was the perfect example, and Town Hall was the perfect example of the fact that people are there for the show. They are there because they want to belong to what people have called a cult. And I think when you, you see 39 minutes of him dancing to songs from the 1970s, you get the sense that people are a part of the MAGA movement for reasons that are very different from political coalitions of the past and the present. I also will say that this is incredibly dangerous. What he is talking about, and I, th I agree with Tim when he talks about that North Korea style statement, that was very jarring. I think that when we use our eyes and we have all our neurons firing appropriately, Chris, we can see that when you you have somebody who wants to be a dictator on day one and you combine that with Project 2025 and the Supreme Court saying that a future president has immunity, we are on the path for something very, very dangerous that is not democracy. And so while it's funny to talk about, 
a weird rally where he's dancing for 39 minutes, I think the stakes could not be higher. Yeah, and, and again, I want to say that I think the reason that we wanted to talk about this was because I wondered the influence that it might have. Nobody thinks, Tim, that this is going to influence those voters who were there. And I personally put undecided voters into two categories, that very tiny number who are undecided about who they might vote for, which I agree with is Erlina, and I think most people do. It's a tiny, tiny number. There's also people undecided about whether they'll vote, right? Can they be inspired by somebody? Yeah. Will they be inspired not to vote for somebody and therefore vote for the other person? Having said that, um, it was one of the interesting things to me last night, because so much was talked about in terms of Joe Biden when he was still the candidate. Uh, first of all, Trump's musical tastes are eclectic uh, from Ave Maria. To, oh, there's the playlist from Ave Maria to Guns N' Roses. Um, you know, throw in a little bit of uh, Rufus Wayne, right? Um, but it almost seemed like he, he lost interest in taking questions and he was much more interested in listening to music. I, I don't know, when you, when you look at sort of the pattern of what we're seeing, what do you think his level of interest in the campaign is? Yeah, um, I'll say it if you don't want to, Chris, but I do think the playlist kind of felt like an old-timey gay bar a little bit from the 80s, so village people and opera and show tunes, uh, whatever. I'm just observing. Uh, somebody's been to a few gay bars. Um, as far as Trump's, like, mental acuity, I, look, I, again, I think that... Uh, the people that are in, excited for Trump, they're not going anywhere. We've already established that. So this is the question. I think it's the challenge for the Harris campaign and, and for those of us who are advocating against Donald Trump, which is that is this risk too great? And, and Harris really pivoted to that in her speech last night. Like, this is too dangerous. This is too risky. And I think that that encompasses his, his uh, comments about the military going after the enemy within. And it also encompasses his mental acuity. Like, do you trust that this guy is going to have the wherewithal in four years? I mean, four weeks. But in four years, when he's 82, when he's older than Joe Biden is today, to be making life or death decisions? I don't think so. And I, I, and I don't think that's a risk worth taking. And I think that's a case that, the camp, that you're going to see the Harris campaign make in the final few weeks. You mentioned, no, you, mentioned, you mentioned Taiwan. You said you would defend them. You also seem to imply that well, well, Putin, you would not. You, Putin, you seem to imply that you had talked to him without I actually confirming. I said I don't comment on those things. I what didn't. about? Can I can I ask you a particular thing about the dollar? You've actually you talked about wars. At the New York Economic Club, you said that if you lost the dollar as a reserve currency, it would be like America losing a war. Yeah. You look at what you're going to do in terms of protectionism. Oh, I'll drive be. countries to use the other yeah. currencies. Yeah. And all that debt is also going to lessen the dollar's status as a, the world's reserve currency. If I'm you worry elected, about that. the dollar is so secure, your reserve currency is the strongest it'll ever be. And uh, you, you, you no country... That, you say that, President Trump, at the moment, there is a thing called the Trump trade in the markets. Do you know what that is? The Trump trade is very simple. People are betting that your policies are going to drive up debt, they're going to drive up inflation, so they're going to drive up inflation ra interest rates. Yeah. Are the investors wrong? Yeah, I had four years no inflation. I had four years no inflation. But that was, that was when you had much... I had four years. It's better than that. And Biden, who has no idea where the hell he is, okay? Biden went two years with no inflation because he inherited from me. And then they started spending money like drunken sailors. They spent so much money. It was so ridiculous, the money they were spending. They were spending on the Green New Scam. A Green New Scam, the Green New Deal, you know, it was, it was conceived of by AOC plus three. She never even studied the environment in college. She went to a nice college. Uh, she came out, she just said, the Green New Scam. She just named all these things. But President Trump, the no, issue no, at the, the markets are looking at the fact you are making all these promises. The latest one was car loans. You're flooding the thing with I, giving giveaways. But we're going to grow. Quite, I was actually quite kind to you. I used... Seven trillion. 
the upper estimate oh, is 15 uh, trillion. Oh, you People can like the Wall Street it. Journal, who's hardly a communist organization, yeah, but you don't know. they have criticized you on this as well. You are running up enormous debt. What, what does the Wall Street Journal know? I'm meeting with them tomorrow. What does the Wall Street Journal know? They've been wrong about everything. So have you, by the way. You've been wrong about you're it. Trying to turn this, you're trying to turn this. You've been wrong about no, it. No, you're, you're trying to turn this into debate. There's a, there are it's business not a debate. people. There no, are but business you're wrong. People. You've been wrong. You've been wrong all your life on this stuff. You've been wrong. Not let me tell you about currency. You're going to, you know, you're going to jump in a lot of, yeah. a lot of different subjects. Well, sure. Well, the sure reserve currency. The no, let's closely. stick to the reserve currency. That's where you started, yeah. right? The reserve currency is under threat because you have Iran, you have Russia, you have China. Once, China is the one that you have to worry about because they want it. Yeah. They want to have the yuan be the, the, the you know, yes. thing of power. So here's what I'm doing. Again, I hate to go back to it. If somebody says, and I know countries want to get out because they don't respect our leadership, they look at this guy, they say, you've got to be kidding, and she's worse than him. By the way, she's, I never thought I'd say this. She is not as smart as Biden, if you can believe. This is not what, we had four years of this, this, this lunacy, and we can't have it anymore. We're not going to have a country left. Okay, currency, very important. Yes. And if you want to go to third world, if you want to go to third world status, lose your reserve currency. We have to have that. We cannot lose it. If you go to, you'll go to third world status in this country because you take a look at the way things are running. If a country tells me, uh, sir, we like you very much, but we're going to no longer adhere to being in the reserve currency, uh, we're not going to uh, salute the dollar anymore, I'll say, that's okay. And, uh, you're going to pay a 100 percent tariff on everything you sell into the United States. And we love your product. I hope you sell a lot of it into the United States. But you're going to pay 100 percent tariff. Uh, he will then follow it up by saying, sir, it would be an honor to stay with the reserve currency. I will be that will be like just playing. That's not even chess. That's checkers. But you don't have other. Listen to this. You don't even, you don't have other people that can talk that way. You know, a lot of people say we love Trump's policy. But we would like to have another messenger because we don't like him. He's a little bit crass. And then, actually, it was Lindsey Graham, I must say. He was a progressive, in all fairness. But Lindsey Graham said, but Trump's policy doesn't work without Trump. And there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, Macron was going to, nice guy, Emmanuel. He's a wise guy, but he's for France, and we're for the USA. You know this story. He was going to tax American companies doing business in France a very substantial tax. And I told my people, I'm not, I didn't even like the companies, but I, I, I'm representing American companies in this case. So I said, call Macron and call his people and say, we're not going to stand for that. And I got uh, Mnuchin and, you know, a lot of guys, smart guys, if I can finish. Yeah. I'll go longer if you want, if no, it no, helps, I because you got to be able to finish. You move too quick. No, you got to be able to finish a thought. Yeah. Because it's very important. You know, this is big stuff we're talking about. You can't go that You've quickly. You've from the dollar to So the let me just tell you. So I said, no, I'm just telling you basic, uh, it's, it's called the weave. It's all these different things happen. Yeah. So let me just say. So I said to Mnuchin, call him up and say, no way. He did, and he came back to see me. He said, they won't do it, sir. It's too late. I said to somebody else, you call him. Then I said, let me do it. And I called him. And I said, Emmanuel... You're taxing American companies very substantially. You're not doing it with other companies. You must think we're stupid. It's not going to happen. But Donald, Donald, I cannot do anything. It's too late. Or it was approved by a legislature. I said, that's okay. Here's the story. Every bottle of wine and champagne that you send into the United States, effective immediately, and I'm signing it as I speak, uh, I'm charging you 100% on every bottle of wine and champagne. You know, they like the wine and champagne, right? Every bottle of wine and champagne that comes into the United States of America has a tax on, starting on Monday morning, this was a Friday, of 100%. And that's better than you're doing, okay? And he said, no, 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 you cannot do that. I said, uh, I've done it. It's already signed. Monday morning goes, may I call you back? Yes, he calls me back in about three minutes. Uh, we have decided to remove the tax from the companies. This, I did this all day long. 
But you don't have, you think Biden does that? I don't think so. Let me, let me. We are, if you can believe it, just 21 days out from election day. Early voting begins today in one of the critical swing states, Georgia. Former President Bill Clinton, the last Democrat before Joe Biden to flip that state blue, campaigned in the Peach State for Kamala Harris yesterday. You have to realize it is literally possible that the whole election could be decided here. That's right. It is possible. Yes, it is. There are, there are seven states where the election is too close to call. One of them, though, is perhaps more important than the rest. Both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump campaigned in Pennsylvania yesterday. Harris going after Trump for his recent comments referring to some Americans as, quote, enemies from within. Donald Trump is increasingly unstable and unhinged. And he is out for unchecked power. That's what he's looking for. He wants to send the military after American citizens. So there's Harris on the one hand. Donald Trump, on the other hand, turned his event into a dance party yesterday after two people suffered medical emergencies at the event. Go and vote. Yes. Let me hear that music, please. Everyone, Let let's thank music. President loud. Trump. Nice and loud. So play YMCA. Go ahead. Let's go. Nice and loud. So CNN's reporter at the event did say there appeared to be some confusion about what was happening while he was up there on the stage. Our panel's here, Jonah Goldberg, CNN political commentator, co-founder of The Dispatch, Elliot Williams, CNN legal analyst, former federal prosecutor, Kate Bedingfield, former White House communications director and a CNN political commentator, and Brad Todd, Republican strategist and a partner in On Message. Welcome to all of you. Um, maybe we should, I don't know, bring back a little bit more YMCA. We could like put a little bit <laughs> of VO there. Just put on music for 52 minutes and, and just sway. sit I mean, and sway. sway. Look, you just, know? Viewers can't, the joy campaign. The, the, viewers <laughs> can't see them, but you have all these balloons up here. You never draw yeah. them. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, we should put some balloons. That would be fun. Uh, but seriously, I mean, I, I'm interested in this because I mean, I, I don't even know how many dozens hundreds of campaign events I have covered in my career. I have never seen anything like this. I've never yeah. seen a candidate do anything like this. It's it, strange. Um, I, it, it sounds like he got a little uh, fed up with taking questions and, <laughs> and went with an unorthodox way of getting around taking questions. Um, look, I, I think this whole election we're getting, the, the, the contrast you're seeing between these campaigns is that I think the Harris people, for understandable reasons, are very frustrated that most Americans or half of America doesn't see the Donald Trump that they see. And their, their basic argument is, look at the guy who actually is there, not the guy that you have nostalgia for, for the pre-COVID economy. And that's a very hard argument to make because people think they're eyewitnesses to what the next Trump presidency is gonna be like. And it's, I think it's gonna be a different presidency. And moreover, those of you who are nostalgic for the Trump presidency and the Trump economy, you're forgetting all of the other things that come along uh, with when Trump is president. Even if you have these fond memories of what your pocketbook looked like at the time, do you remember 2020? Do you remember what America was like? Do you remember uh, how you felt at the time? There was a lot of craziness and silliness that, that we saw here. But again, I think there's that frustration that something is not coming through to that yep. whatever percentage of Americans just aren't buying it. I tell you what, though, as an analyst, I look at the, the juxtaposition there, and you know, the campaign that's having the most fun usually is the one that feels best about itself. And I know a lot of Republicans were a little worried because Donald Trump wasn't having a whole lot of fun in September. And he was grumpy, he was grousing. You still see it poke through every once in a while. I think a lot of people will be happy to see a Trump that's having fun on the trail uh, because it indicates that he's more confident about what well, the election's I, going may, on. Maybe, but uh, also, is, is he running through the tape here? I mean, you combine this this like concert yesterday with <laughs> he's campaigning in California, he's campaigning in New York. I mean, is he really is he really like hustling for the voters that he needs in the final push here? There's a lot of chatter about is Harris doing enough to run through the tape. I don't know that you could really argue that Donald Trump is. 
Um, but I also think we're going to see the shift uh, from Harris back into a more aggressive prosecution of the case against Trump. Because, look, when you are running against a somebody who, uh, you know, should be a historically uh, unpopular opponent, you do have to use that against them. I know there's a lot of back and forth about is she, you know, has she done enough to make the case for herself? And yes, that's true. You have to give people something to vote for. But you, it would be malpractice to abandon making these points about the kind of fundamental threat that Trump poses to democracy. I mean, you have to use your opponent's vulnerabilities against them. And I, I think, I hope, we're going to see her do that over this final three weeks here. I think that's a trap for her. Uh, the, all the all voters' worries about Donald Trump in that regard are baked in. Uh, then, and the candidates need to fight over what they're going to do in the next four years. There, I agree there has to be a forward-looking element to, to the message, but I think we've seen, for example, you know, when Vance wouldn't say in the VP debate you know, that, that Donald Trump lost in 2020, that was the, one of the most uh, you know, problematic moments for swing voters. We saw it in the focus groups afterwards. People said, you know, I can't accept that. And so you know, that is an extraordinary thing, and I think she has to use that extraordinariness well, uh, you know, in her campaign. And speaking of unusual tactics at campaign rallies, uh, one of the things that Harris did yesterday was actually put Donald Trump's comments, his recent comments from the, over the weekend uh, about the enemy within, about using the military on a big screen and playing it uh, for people at the rally. And then the campaign also cut, um, let's play a little bit of, of this ad that they turned around and cut immediately, uh, hitting Trump on these comments, watch. The worst people are the enemies from within. The enemy from within are more dangerous than Russia. We have some very bad people. It should be very easily handled by the military. I do remember the day that he suggested that we shoot people on the streets. The second term would be worse. There will be no one to stop his worst instincts. So meanwhile, Brad, I, I take your point about needing to be forward looking. In many ways, that they're trying to get people to look forward at that. Yeah, and again, I, I, I think there's the problem, like there's a disconnect. They also have some good ads where they go through a lot of Trump's former cabinet members saying he's not fit. I can't, we can't do this again and all that. The problem is I just think there are, for a lot of Trump voters, well, again, Harris isn't actually trying to reach Trump voters at this point. Harris is trying to reach people who are on the fence or may just not want to vote. But I think that there are, for a lot of people, they say, well, they said all of this in 2016 about him, how he's gonna be dangerous and all that kind of stuff. And he wasn't a problem. And what they're not factoring in is that the people who held him back, the circuit breaker people, aren't going to be in this administration. So it's just a different equation than the last time. Right. And making that argument is pretty tricky. Let's bring in CNN's Isaac Dover for more on this. Where do you want to begin? What exactly happened last night? Uh, it, it's a little bit strange to uh, even wrap our heads around, Kate. Uh, Donald Trump was uh, doing a, uh, a an event that was meant to be him speaking, a town hall, answering questions and talking about what he would be doing as president. There were some medical incidents, two people for one and then another uh, collapse were uh, being treated and Donald Trump just started to ask for music to be played instead and then he danced. But look, I can talk about it. I think we should just take a look at what happened there last night. Go and vote. Let me hear that music, please. Everyone, Let let's thank music. President loud. Trump. Nice and loud. So play YMCA. Go ahead. Let's go. Nice and loud. And so that's what we got out of President Trump with three weeks to uh, Election Day here. We did not hear a lot about uh, his policy proposals or what he is saying he would do right now. We got a lot of dancing for about 40 minutes last night, Kate. Honestly, the people there, they were there for it, that's for sure. Um, his play, <laughs> there for his playlist and there for the dance moves. Uh, I want to ask you about kind of the new tactic of Kamala Harris as well, playing clips of Donald Trump during her rally last night to drive her message um, in a new way that she believes that, he, that she calls him dangerous and unstable. She's now headed to Michigan today. What are the plans? 
Well, what she's going to be doing in Michigan is highlighting uh, something that she uh, rolled out yesterday. It's called a, an economic uh, opportunity agenda for black men, trying to make that case to black men around the country, that especially younger black men, that she should be the one with their vote. Uh, and she'll be doing that in an appearance with Charlemagne the God, the radio host uh, for the Breakfast Club, talking about uh, all of those things. Uh, but she's also taking, with three weeks left here, a pretty uh, stringent stance against things that Donald Trump has been saying. And her approach has been to not just talk about them, but to let people see it for themselves. So uh, one of the clips that uh, she has talked about uh, is this uh, comment from Donald Trump a, a couple days ago that uh, there is an enemy within that uh, might need to be dealt with by the military. Let's take a listen to what, uh, what was said there. He considers anyone who doesn't support him or who will not bend to his will an enemy of our country. He wants to send the military after American citizens. And that is her speaking about these comments from uh, former President Trump, uh, that there is this enemy within uh, leftist, radical people, he said, that might need to have the National Guard or the military brought in to deal with them. And those are uh, comments that Harris wants people to be focused on, which he thinks about what a Trump presidency take two would be.